in the work that uh, where I've been working, the work that we're doing, uh, some of the things, the efforts that uh, we've been trying to push are about trying to get architects to be more aware about not what their hopes and aspirations of a design are. I mean, we are designers, which means we're sort of, it's always a projective enterprise, right? We're thinking, if I do this, this will happen. And my own tortured background was one of starting out as an experimental physicist and then moving through a, a series of, of career moves, each of which made perfect sense at the time. Um, but I never lost track of the scientific method where if you have a hypothesis, you test it, and the fun part is going back and looking. And it's okay if the answer was no, that didn't work. In fact, negative results in science are more useful than positive results, right? The negative result means that no one else has to go look there because you've proven that that path is actually not a very productive path. But architects are kind of in the business of selling possibility and selling a sort of projective vision, uh, which means that you know, the best building is the one that's still in their head. And uh, that the idea that you would go back, you know, it's like looking behind the refrigerator. It means you might have to clean there. If we go back to our buildings and look at how they're performing, the best it could be was as good as your highest vision during the design phase. And more than likely, half the time, it will be less good than you'd hoped. And so there's naturally in the architectural profession, uh, a sort of, there can be a kind of resistance to going back and looking. Um, so when uh, uh, my family's uh, life plan took us to New Orleans uh, about uh, four years ago, I joined the staff of Execu Dumas Ripple, which is an architecture firm of about 45 people. Uh, and it's a firm that does all kinds of things. We do multifamily housing, but uh, we do a lot of institutional work. We're for universities, laboratories, schools, high schools, uh, art museums. And it's known mostly as a design-y firm, which means that they have a portfolio of beautiful, beautiful buildings and little chapels and, and delightful uh, places. Um, and uh, it, all of the principals had always attempted to design with what they said was sustainability in mind. And they took me aside when I got there and they said, see, everybody thinks we're really sustainable. Um, and, and it's really great that they think that, but we have no idea if we really are. And so I said, great, what I want to do is see if we can put that to the test. And so while I've been at SQ Dumas Ripple, I've been leading design projects, but more and more I'm plugging into all the work that we do and asking, well, did it really work and what can we learn from that? So over here on the left, I want to show we started, we stole fair and square from the USGBC, has this thing called a, a lead project profile. But uh, we're in deep red state territory and a lot of our projects are not lead. Uh, so, but we are still interested in their performance. So we set up a framework on our projects where we go back afterwards and we look at how did they do on energy, how did they do on water. If they were a lead project, it's nice, what was their lead score and, and where did we get that? Um, and then we try to walk the walk in our own lives where we have a process internally where we'll go through people's houses and, uh, and develop a HERS rating. Do people know what a HERS, a HERS score is? It's a home energy rating system score. Uh, and a HERS score, if you're building single family houses, uh, a score of 100 is if you just met the current national building energy code for a house. Um, a typical, so to walk the walk, this is a, um, my family's house. It's a 1880 shotgun camelback, uh, which a camelback means it's got a hump in the back. That's, it's two stories in the back due to a peculiarity of the tax law where you were taxed on your number of stories at the front of the house. Um, and a uh, 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 delightful uh, house. Uh, when we got there, it had a HERS score of 188, which means it would be projected to use if typically occupied about 1.8 times as much energy as, the, as a new house of the same size built to current code. And, uh, uh, my wife and I have a deal when we move to a new town. I promise not to start renovating the house until one year after we've been there. Uh, partly that lets us live in the house and kind of understand how it really works. And I think Henry Gifford showed us that uh, the best benchmark for a building is the building itself, right? And you learn how it's working and then you come up with plans for modifying it. So, you know, the old Mark Twain quote about the coldest summer I ever experienced, the coldest winter I ever experienced was the summer I spent in San Francisco. Um, I had never expected coming from Canada to move to New Orleans and be cold. But in fact, the coldest I have ever, and I lived in Boston, I lived, my family comes from northern Wisconsin. Um, the coldest winter I have ever experienced was a winter I experienced in um, this house in New Orleans because 
it, it turns out that, in fact, the buildings are up on piers, good sensible plan for a muddy, flood-prone uh, environment. Um, the, that, those houses are uninsulated, and there's just you know three inches or three quarters of an inch of wood between you and that outside world, and open cracks over a hundred years. And uh, we had a uh, $300 heating bill one month in New Orleans, um, and it was I used because I'm a nerd uh, at heart. I used my little infrared thing to find the the floor was at 55 degrees. The top of the stairs, the heat had risen up the open stairwell. Uh, the top of the stairs was at 95 degrees. And so we were completely uncomfortable. We're paying $300 a month to, ha to heat our, our, our little house. And it was comfort that made us reconsider that my wife finally said, OK, 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 you can do something to the house. And so we went through and did some insulation. And we converted the uh, heating system to an air source heat pump and things like that. And by doing those measures, dropped the house to a HERS score of 77. Great. Um, but more importantly, we became comfortable. And that was why we did it. Um, and then, yeah, it's got a convenient south-facing roof, so we added some solar panels and got down to a HERS score of 32. So zero would be a net zero house, right? So this is at the same time that my uh, um, firm is just finishing its first house for the Make It Right neighborhood and, and so on. It sips. It's got everything, every imaginable component going on in it. Um, but in fact, you know, my 1880 shotgun Camelback house has a utility bill, an average utility bill of $37 a month. And uh, so for me, it was saying that, yes, you can do jaunty modern architecture and get great energy performance. You can also just take existing buildings and, and get there too. Um, so one of the characteristics that we're sort of proud of at EDR is that we measure everything. So we go back. And um, soberly, uh, we try to talk every uh, client into letting us, into sharing their utility bills. Um, and there's always trepidation at the beginning, because again, what if you find out it's not doing right? Or will we get sued? You know, if they don't know, why, why bother you? Know, why bother them? But the firm made a commitment, so we go back. And um, these numbers are just showing, we work on this wide range of buildings. So this is a, a, uh, an art museum that has very sensitive collections and everything has to be maintained just so in very careful conditions and so on. This is a laboratory building. The numbers, the big number is the energy use per square foot per year expressed in Firkins per fortnight. Odd little units, the kilo BTUs per square foot per year. It's, it's just a unit. Um, but the, the one to know is a typical single family house is sort of 40 to 50. And that's if, a way of adding the electricity and the heat use to a single common unit. Um, and uh, the little yellow numbers are what the average building of that building type uses. So laboratories are notorious hogs. So the average nationally of a laboratory building is 370 kilobtus per square foot per year. Um, this particular building we're greatly proud of. Um, this building's an art museum, and it turns out getting a, a statistically valid number for art museums is really hard. There aren't enough of them. I mean, that's a problem we face socially. There aren't enough art museums, but there also aren't enough in data sets to have meaningful comparisons. Um, public schools, office buildings, this is our own office, and so on. Um, so we work on a lot of different things and try to find what's the thing we should compare ourselves against and what can we learn from that. So about two, three years ago, there was a nice article about three of the Make It Right houses. Um, and Green Source Magazine published this profile. And they called us up, actually the Make It Right people called us up very happily to tell us that our um, house would be featured, the design that we had produced. Uh, and in fact, they had built four of them by that point. But that one of our houses would be featured because it was the best energy performer in Make It Right. And we said, yes, we must be geniuses. And uh, so we looked at it, and we thought, very nice uh, chart. And so this is the, remember I said the average house uses around 40 to 50 kb2 per square foot per year. This house uses, uh, of what is that, about 12 of electricity it consumed. Its solar panels produced about 11. And then there was a little gas used for heating hot water. So yes? No, that's the point. Right. It's an absolute number. And the funny thing is, you'd think you need to normalize it down to the heating degree day and cooling degree day and all that sort of thing. But in fact, the national average, the range between, in the continental US, between um, deep south, far north, uh, so on, ranges from 40 to 50 for single family houses. So yes, there are effects. Um, but the effects of like the average house size is different by region too. 
And um, so it also turns out that that metric can be skewed. If you make a very small house, every house has a kitchen, right? So there's sort of a, you know, as you, it's not a line that goes through zero, the amount of energy use versus the amount of floor area, right? And so um, we just, just look at the absolute number and we don't get into weather normalization because partly it, uh, it can be deceiving. Partly also, I think just last year, the DOE just published that now more than half the energy consumed in American homes is not consumed heating and cooling. It's consumed in TVs and eye things and so on, right? And so um, what that means is that it's important to make a great building that responds to the weather, but it's also just important to look at all the other light, you know, lighting and occupant behavior things that are probably not so weather climate dependent. So the, the, the net energy use intensity, EUI, uh, in the metric uh, for this was three. And we thought, great, we're like three compared to 45. That's great. Um, so we then went and we said, well, we built, f you guys built three more of those houses. So, you know, can we get into those? And we ended up, there was some trepidation because, again, what if we got a bad number and so on? What would that say? But we said, eh. so a friend of a friend of a friend knew the homeowner of one of the houses. So we went in, a very nice man said, sure, come on in. And um, so we must be idiots. So there's, the, there's another version of the same house built right down the street and it's up at 61. And so obviously it must be the occupant's fault, right? Um, it must be, it can't be something we did wrong with the design because it was the same design. Um, and it must be something that they're doing wrong, those greedy occupants. Well, this is not the first time this has been observed uh, that there's a lot of occupant to occupant variation. There's a, this is a study done on some 10 Habitat for Humanity homes in, I think, Oklahoma. And then uh, SMUD did a study back in 2004 on homes in Sacramento. And these are all essentially identical homes. And there's this huge variation. And typically, if you look at schools, homes, offices, whatever your data set, you'll find a three to one variation in energy use per square foot from the best to the worst, depending on things that are happening uh, in those buildings. So OK, well, maybe it is the occupants. Okay, here comes the scary chart in my talk. I think there's only one scary chart, but I want to, this one's really important. I want to talk you through it. And I wish Henry Gifford were here because I think this was the, the thing that launched the great uh, struggle between Henry and uh, USGBC. This was a study of 100 lead buildings um, uh, done where they, what they did was they, they went to the study and they looked at what did the computer model predict the energy use per square foot would be. And these are all kinds of different buildings, offices, schools, homes, everything. So there was, you know, you're going to get different predicted values. And then on the vertical axis is plotted what did they actually measure in a year's operation, usually a year in. And for those, are people, how many people know what R squared is when you plot up two things? And for the other half, so this is a, a thing you learn in science class where you, you want to say, we want to see, you know, how the cancer rate depends on peanut butter consumption. So we're going to plot of one versus the other, and we'll look at to what extent did one predict the other. And it turns out if it has some effect, it might be that it's, it's responsible for some of the variation. And so if the correlation is perfect, that number, that R squared, will be one. So whatever went in per perfectly predicts whatever's coming out. The correlation coefficient for these first 100 lead buildings is 0.33. What that means is that the, the variation in design was responsible for one-third of the variation in observed performance. The two-thirds of the spread in, in reported energy performance was something else. So what's the something else? Well, there, it's like a great Agatha Christie uh, mystery, right? There's plenty of, we're in the drawing room, kind of like this. We're in the drawing room, and there's plenty of suspects, and they're all very plausible suspects. It could be the architect. The architect designed some crazy-ass thing. Uh, you know, too much glass, faces due west, what the heck was he doing, and so on. Uh, the engineer didn't know what he was doing, he designed a far too complicated system. Uh, he tried to use ducts to do both heating, cooling, ventilation, and air conditioning, like uh, Henry dislikes so much. Um, the energy modeler often does not actually model what the building is, because the computer models are limited in what, the, you know, what you can put into the model, and so sometimes you have to kind of fake out the model and pretend that this is this other thing, and so on. So you might not be entirely surprised. Also, I, I first came to practice in California. What I learned was as soon as the building passed, they stopped adding features to the model uh, as soon as it passed code. So for example, the architect might have lovingly put in all kinds of solar shading devices that are quite a lot of work to model. 
And what would happen is the modeler would get to a point and say, the building passes, I don't have to add those to my model because all we had to do was show compliance. Um, the contractor, contractor's not building what the architects drew, are you kidding? Well, it sometimes happens. And um, shortcuts happen, they couldn't get that model, so they substituted this other model. Uh, the building operations staff, uh, it could be that you, know, you had a building that had a boiler, and now he's got a ground source heat pump into this and that and the other thing, and it's the same guy who ran the boiler, and nobody bothered to ever spend any time with Charlie, the boiler operator, to talk to him about this amazing new F-15 fighter plane piece of heating and cooling equipment and to end skill him or her. And then there's those pesky occupants who mess up our buildings by being in them. So, and through their choices might change the energy use. So there's plenty of possible suspects, but it's not good enough just to find someone to blame. What's more interesting is to find out, well, what happened and can you, can you change that? So Clark Brockman at CERA, which is a marvelous firm, Portland-based, um, has this chart I've, I've stolen from fair and square, um, where he shows this gap between here's what the energy modeler thought the building would use and here's what's actually happening based on the occupant's actions. And in between those two are this chain of being, uh, you know, uh, one to the next to the next. In theory, they're all talking to each other, uh, but in fact, most of the time they aren't. And Part of the problem is that they're all thinking something different. Their vision of what's going on in the building is different. And there is no shared vision, even if they had a design charrette where they all sat at the table. And so I want to talk about each of those chains. And each of, I've seen buildings break at each of those points of that great chain of connection. And so I want to give you a, tell you a few stories. It's what I learned actually being here a year ago and Jonathan uh, and uh, Paul Hawken sat in on a session of a meeting of uh, sustainable design leaders from architectural firms. And they talked about that often what matters most is to tell stories. Um, that stories kind of connect with our own historical ways of thinking and uh, can uh, uh, have greater staying power. This is our firm's first lead building. It was done long before I got there. It was uh, opened in 2006. Um, it's a um, research laboratory and visitor center uh, in uh, Key West, Florida. And uh, it was predicted, this lineup here is sort of, if you, you know, because the weather's there pretty constant, the temperatures don't change that much. Uh, this was, uh, if you took the predicted building built to code, how much energy it would be expected to use, and this is what the electric bill would be expected to be, what the computer model said was, you should be down 25%. And for the first two months of operation, the building sang, it was fully commissioned, everyone had the party, things were great. And then two months in, the building controls manufacturer, the people who make those complicated programs, remember we saw that screen for the building management system? The guy came in and said, you're gonna love it. We have a new release of our software. Let me install it for you. And he installed uh, a new version of their control software, completely reset everything, where all of the valves and systems and controls had been lovingly orchestrated together, overwrote them all, and the building's energy use doubled. And um, that was, you know, a little bit worrisome. And uh, they're looking at these numbers and saying, they're running a little higher than we expected, you know. And uh, they called up the commissioning agent, and the commissioning agent said, well, I'm based in Atlanta. At no charge, I'm happy to come down and see what's gone wrong. But we're out of fee now, and if you can just spot me the $300 plane ticket from Atlanta to Key West, I will come, spend the day, check it out, and see if we can diagnose what's wrong. And the guy said, I'm a government agency. I don't have a line item in my budget for buying $300 airplane tickets. Can't do it, can't do it. So for a year, the building sort of limped along. It doubled its energy use. Now, remember, this is the, this is the number of kilowatt hours per month. So every month, they're burning $10,000 of extra utility spending here. So at this point, somebody came and approached the, uh, the building operator and said, you know, actually, NOAA, has uh, an indefinite quantity, uh, uh, indefinite description, IDIQ contract for an, a local energy auditor. And he can come by and diagnose what's going wrong. No charge to you. And the guy said, great. The guy came in and says, oh, I know what your problem is. Here, let me change all these knobs like this. And that was when the energy use doubled again. <clears throat> and then the mold bloom happened. And after the, decontam the men in the decontamination suits were finished with the building, they found $300 in petty cash, flew the commissioning agent down, he reset all of the controls to what the design intent had been, and the building runs like a top. Spent a lot of time with the building operations guy. They work together, and the building runs like a top. In fact, uses about 40% less energy 
than the code minimum building, rather than 20 as had been originally predicted. So this is a story, well, to some extent, whose fault was that, right? Think through all the, all the ways of the chain. Part of it was that the building had no particular alarm system. We've got all this computerization there, but there's nothing that just says, something's weird, something's wrong about this. Maybe we should go find, you know, find out. The commissioning process had found a lot of useful information. They found, for example, that when installing the air handling unit, the thing that pumps the air around, two wires had been crossed, and so it was delivering air through the return duct and, supply, uh, and, and uh, uh, returning air through all of the supply loops, which meant that one place in the hallway was getting all the cool air, and the rest of it was just sucking the air around, hopefully in a circle, and so the system was not you know, working right. So commissioning caught the really big gross errors, but after it, after the fact, the system itself couldn't diagnose the problems that it was up against. But by working with the, uh, with the building operator and end-skilling him, if that's a word, uh, raising his skill level to understand what was really going on with uh, the, the building, it resulted in a building that really works. Here's, so then we do another nature center on the Gulf Coast. And for the first two months, the client goes ballistic. And he said, you guys are idiots. Look at my energy bill. I've never seen energy bills like this. This is crazy. And you know, here on the gray dots are the month-to-month you know, -month predicted energy use um, uh, of, the, of a code minimum building. And the gold line is, is the uh, energy model. You know, the building was supposed to use, say, 20, 15%, 20% less. And yet, here's the actual energy use for the first three, four months. So there are lots of drives out to Apalachicola, meeting with, getting the installer, getting all the guys working together, and finding out um, which things had been, um, were not actually uh, running correctly and were not doing what the little sensors said they were doing. So these are both about, and these may not be buildings. I know the majority of people here are working on multifamily housing. You may not be working with mechanical systems of this complexity that you, you end up with often at laboratory and commercial buildings, but it's just to say that in general, things are getting more and more complicated as we try to push a more and more performance. You know, our cars used to have a carburetor, and you'd lift up the hood, and you'd muck with it, and then the car would go. And now our cars will have computers in them. Pretty soon our salt shakers will have computers in them, right? But um, what, what we have to know is that this level of sophistication requires a level of sophistication on our part, and not just throwing up our hands. And then once you do that, the building hums, and in fact is, produ is consuming, in fact, again, less energy than the energy model predicted. So often there's a tendency when things don't match prediction to say, well, energy models, they're just people making stuff up. And I have talked to energy modelers who've said, well, what number do you want? And I said, I, you know, and I said, the truth. And they're, oh, the truth, what is truth? Um, and, uh, but in fact, energy models will correctly predict what the energy will use, what the building will use if you correctly put in all of exactly how the building is being occup occupied and operated. So here's a building that's not ours, but it's by a, a respected colleague in uh, New Orleans, where they took a 1912, a beautiful uh, uh, building uh, on the Tulane campus and did a lead gold renovation, and then started measuring and monitoring. So here's the energy use per square foot of the average university building across the US. And here's, if they had built this building from new construction and built it to current code how much energy it was expected to use. And their model of this renovated building was a modest 18% savings, but of course, compared to the average university building, really quite good. Well, that's good, except then they start measuring in year one, and it's way up here. And uh, I talked to the commissioning agent, and I said, you know, I know it's not my business, not my building, but I you know, know people at Tulane, and I've seen these numbers. Do you know what's going on? And he said, yeah, well, they really wanted to get done with the project quickly. And so we asked them which hours per week you know, of, on each day, what is the occupancy schedule for the building? And they said, that has to be decided by an academic committee. The academic committee can't meet because they can't schedule a meeting. Until they meet, they'll get really upset if you set the schedule without getting their input. So just set the building to be on 24 hours a day. And um, so they started doing that. And then there was this huge problem with you know, the electricity use was sort of what was expected, but the steam use, the heat use, was huge. And again, this is New Orleans. And uh, so people say, you know, it's as if something's wrong with this steam valve. Maybe it's not the building, but it's maybe just the valve is doing something funny. And they said, it can't be. Our building automation system says it's working correctly. And eventually they went through, they checked the steam valve and the steam meter, found that there was a, defect, a defective component, and replaced it. 
and then that was done halfway through year two. And now in year three, amazingly, the building's consuming within a couple percent of what the computer model had said. So again, computer models, energy models work if the building is really what, the, what, what, you know, the, what was in people's minds when they designed it. Now, one of the great revelations is we're starting to get more than just survey data. We're getting, because of plan uh, of law 84 uh, and similar laws around the country, we're starting to get data on, on uh, the energy use per square foot of buildings. Uh, this uh, happens to be multifamily. Uh, the EUIs, the energy use intensities of multifamily buildings, and I think these are all buildings with five or more, you know, buildings with five or more units all have to add, or is it just buildings over 50,000 square feet? Anyone from New York? Over 50. Right, right. So this is gold, right? Because what's happening is that, is that we're finding cases where there are two buildings, you know, down the street from each other, same vintage, and one of them's here and one of them's over here. And the person running this building or owning this building or operating this building, the agency responsible is going to say, you know, when they go to their super and they say, how come our building's using this much? They say, yeah, it's an old building. What do you expect? I say, well, how come there's a building just like that down the street that's not, right? So it becomes embarrassing. And the good news is, well, I once heard it's a violent example, but Oppenheimer is said to have said that the secret of the atomic bomb was that you could build one. Because, um, you know, in other words, so many people are held back by their idea that something's not possible. And once you know that it's possible because someone else has demonstrated it, then you say, I, I, if they've figured out a way, there must be a way to do it. I'll figure out a way to do it. And so this simple sense of disclosure and awareness is one that's driving change, right? Because what it allows people to do is say, if they can do it, we got to figure out a way to do it too. So that's great for multifamily buildings because there's a gazillion of them. What do you do if you're working on a building type that there isn't a lot of data for? A lot of you may have, say, community centers or some other kinds of elements for which there might not be such great data. Um, I found that there's a management association of people who manage art museums. And I kind of sweet talked the guy out of the data and started plotting it and finding that you know, there are art museums. Uh, this is how many of the buildings use this much energy per square foot? There are some art museums that use five times as much energy per square foot as others in their, in their data set. And, but of course, there's all kinds of different sorts of art museums, right? There are some where you're, you, know, you have to keep, you've got the you know, Rembrandt painting and you have to have very strict environmental controls, and then there's a museum of farm implements, right? Where it's, it's a barn, right? So it'll probably have a very low energy use. So some of it may be due to differences in program, but some might be due to differences in design and operation. And, and, but just laying this out helps you understand. Um, and Marcel works a lot in schools. And schools, I think, are, uh, you know, the interesting thing is they think of themselves as learning organizations. And so they're all about learning. And so there's been great work done in school districts around the country and around North America. This happens to be data from Toronto, where this were 50 schools built in a 10-year period to pretty much the same allowed budget per square foot. Different architects, different sites, yeah, 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 yeah. But they're all K through 12 schools, or actually K-8 schools. Um, and they, use it the, they looked at the energy use per square foot. And they, this is just a rank order chart, where this is the school that uses the least and the school that uses the most. And the interesting thing, of course, is that the school that uses the most uses three times as much energy per square foot per year in Toronto. So you know, no need for a climate adjustment. It's all the same interesting climate. The really interesting thing is this little red arrow, which is that when this principal was told where her school was, she had been fatalistic about her utility bill. It is what it is. It must, when you ask people, why is their bill so high, it's because the utility is screwing me. But instead, if you say, well, wait, there's this one that's you know, half a mile away that's using half as much energy as you. In six months, she took her school from here to there through uh, no cost measures of just operational changes, awareness, and working with her staff. So again, awareness is key. It wasn't that people were being greedy. They just kind of didn't know and didn't know that it was possible. So nevertheless, people often will say, well, it's because there's something different about my building than their building. And that's why, that's why they're so good and I'm so bad, and so don't, don't blame me. So sometimes it's interesting to say, what if we had data within one building? So it's only the building is one building, it's one building envelope, and so on. This is uh, an apartment building that we did, uh, opened uh, in April 2010 in uh, New Orleans. It's a 250-unit apartment building. Uh, it being in New Orleans, A, you're required to have parking, uh, and so the first 
nine floors of that are a parking structure that it's living on, and that's a sky lobby. And then it's actually, it looks like a big cube, but it's actually an L doing the corner and generating a, a, a courtyard, a good New Orleans courtyard, just nine stories in the air. Um, and um, this building's been fully occupied since the day it opened. Uh, it opened uh, the month of the BP oil spill and when a huge number of people had to find, suddenly find places to stay, and then they moved on and out, but now it's stayed fully occupied. So the nice thing is that it's a, we're pretty proud of it, it's a tight envelope. This was a, what, what's the polite term? A frugal owner um, who did not want to spend a lot of money, but for the nerds in the house who want to know a little bit about the mechanical system and so on, in every unit, there, we heard last night's talk with uh, Henry Gifford um, and uh, uh, Steve uh, Bluestone. Uh, there's, it's like that in that there's a heat pump in every unit, but the heat pump doesn't dump to the outside. In, there's a loop that runs through the building of water that's maintained at 70 degrees. And what happens is every unit has its own little heat pump, and if the, if the, uh, if the occupant wants the room to be warmer, it sucks heat out of that water as it's passing by. And if the occupant wants the unit to be colder, it dumps heat into the unit. So every occupant has complete control over their own temperature, and every unit is individually metered. And then there's a little plant up on the rooftop whose job it is to make sure that the water's always at 70 degrees in the loop. So if it's really hot outside, it cools it. If it's really cold outside, there's a boiler to warm it back up. And um, so what we wanted to do was do a field study on this building find out, is it really comfortable? So we're reading a bunch of meters. But again, the, uh, the anonymity of the occupants is, is preserved. But here's what we find. So this is the energy use per, squ uh, per square foot uh, going this way. And this is the number of apartments that had that energy use per square foot. And what you'll see is there's one person out here at 67, about seven people down here are around 32, between 30 and 35, really, and so on. And so you get this beautiful, well, it's, I think it's actually a Poisson distribution, I forget. It's a shifted bell curve. And um, what you're seeing is that the median value is lower. It's lower by about a good 20% than the average multifamily building in the southeast. This value is published by the US government from surveys in the RECS database, the Residential Energy Consumption Survey database. But they only tell you what that average is. They don't tell you that this is what's actually going on inside your building, because usually you can't get at data like this. So this is telling us that, you know, there are some people out here live in large, and there's some people out here live in frugal. These are all one and two bedroom units. They're not that, they're, we wouldn't expect that much variation in occupancy. So these are pretty much entirely occupant choices. We know they have the same building envelope. We can do analysis to find out how much of it depends on building orientation. And it turns out, because we were pretty careful, the only overglazed unit is, the, uh, the only overglazed component of the building is the big public commons. Um, but all of the buildings have a, have a uh, moderate, but not, they're not, they're floor to ceiling glass, but a, but a slice, not the whole building, yeah? Yeah, this is everything. So it's not all about heating, because in the end of the day, that's what matters, the total bill, right? So, um, uh, so from this, we start to see what the spread is and what the opportunities are. So we, we're just in our second year of collecting this benchmark data. And then what we're ready to do, what I've learned, my wife calls it, it's got an unfortunate term, a manipulative experiment. Sounds sort of evil. A manipulative, you know, biologists do observational experiments. You just go through and you look at what's there. And then a manipulative experiment is you say, I'm going to do this on this plot of land and this on this plot of land and look at the difference in what, what, I, what occurs. So because we've got 250 apartment units in this building, what we're hoping to do is do an experiment where we talk to half of them or inform half of them of where they stand and don't do the other and then watch what happens. Uh, again, it's delicate stuff because it's about, it, you know, how to do this in a way that implies there's an opportunity here rather than there's a scold here and so on. This is uh, going to be a delicate experiment to design. But, you know, a lot of people have been trying to think of how to do this. Yeah? Does this building have its own water heater? Yes. Each apartment has its own water heater. Each apartment has its own heat pump. Um, the building owner pays for to guarantee that that loop of water has a constant temperature loop. And so he has an interest in, in, uh, in the whole building shifting down, but the variation, there's still, a, if you will, a market signal being sent to each occupant. So it's kind of a shared, it's a sh you know, shared opportunity. Um, now, all of this thing is that, yes, energy you know, use, we want it down. We want the planet to last as long as it can. Um, 
But the real goal is best comfort at least energy. And so um, uh, what I want to talk a little bit about is this is what Andy Padian talked about, uh, uh, what do you call it? fertilizing the field behind you uh, or sowing the seeds? I don't know what it was, some term. Um, I teach uh, uh, in my night job is I teach at Tulane University. I proposed a course uh, that would be a, an elective uh, for people interested in doing building studies. And I wrote to enable the students to have tools to go measure stuff, because my inner nerd wanted everything. I love, I love widgets, doesn't everybody. Um, I wrote a grant proposal to uh, the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards uh, to develop this new course, where students would go do field studies of buildings and learn from them. And uh, this got approved. And then what happened was the person who taught the required building science course in the Tulane School of Architecture curriculum and I had lunch at the Napoleon House, a nice muffaletta, and um, we shared. And he said, you could teach the course that I've been teaching for the last 25 years, and I could go teach a studio instead. And so because of that, I ended up, now I teach the required building science course um, uh, at Tulane. And so what we do is we have 64 students. We break them into 16 teams. And you know, I teach them about R values and heat pumps and all the good stuff during the evening lectures. And then on the weekends, they go and instrument buildings around the city. And they develop a hypothesis. Often we'll do the first half of the semester one team, the second half of the semester another team. We'll do observations and then hypotheses and test them and so on, looking at comfort and energy use. Because again, the goal isn't that people are uncomfortable. You know, we shouldn't be trying to save energy by making people uncomfortable, although people do often shift their comfort zone. But I also want the students to understand the notions of comfort and measurement are um, sometimes not arbitrary, but not as hard and fast as the engineers tell them. So for example, uh, someone here earlier on was blaming the architects for overlighting the, the corridors. But in fact, I'm often fighting the engineers who want to meet, because their book told them, you need 60 foot candles here. And so what we do is we give these students meters, and they just carry them around. They try to hide them so they don't look too nerdy. But they carry them around, and they're required to keep journals of places they go and experiences they have, and then write down the number. They have to first say what the experience was. It was bright, I could read, it was pleasant, it was dim, I couldn't, whatever it was gone. And then they, pull, they whip out their meter and they measure what was the light level really. And they start to learn that often these things are very contextual. And so the number, you, you can't do without numbers, but you can't let the numbers do you. Um, and so we work on buildings that are single family homes, historic buildings, all kinds of different things. Uh, for example, here on the right-hand side, Global Green uh, has uh, 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 four identical houses. Uh, in two of them, are, they're both occupied by young couples, um, and they are literally down the street from each other. One of them uses twice what the other does, and that was sort of a lesson for them in this variation that's occupant-dependent. We also learn how to document why it is that their own school of architecture building is so damned uncomfortable. So the nice thing is, you know, there's this whole joke about the, the plural of anecdote is not data. But sometimes anecdote, is, you know, are data. And so using Facebook, they just post it to all the Tulane architecture students and say, talk about your comfort right now. And, um, you know, so somebody goes, I'm, I'm cold AF in, in room 204 right now. And so, and the only thing worse than sitting in 204 is that clicking noise in 404. And uh, what do you mean by comfort levels? 204 is always really warm, and it smells funny. These are all real things that people need to hear. So there's a, t a design team that's starting to work on a renovation for this building. And this information is being fed back. It's, here's how the building really performs. So you can harvest that knowledge. So we have these teams of students going around and instrumenting buildings. And one of the nice things of using live humans, these machines are great because they can log, for example, this is a, li a library floor plate, and the little green buttons are, we're looking about where people are going on stacks. Libraries are more used than ever. They're just not used for what we think libraries are used for. Right? They're the great social spaces. They're the last commons that people all think that they can support. And, but we were interested in, we're lighting this building 24 hours a day on the campus. Maybe we don't need to light all these things. Let's find out where the people are. So then they do into little spot checks of here's where people actually sit. But another point of this that's really key is we've talked about, and somebody did an anecdote earlier in this workshop, about comfort being sort of something that's internal. It's not just a number. So one of the buildings we always have them study is the building of this house of this gentleman who lives in New Orleans in a house with no air conditioning in the Garden District. And oh, no air conditioning. How could that be possible? And it turns out it's, you know, it's gorgeous, it's beautiful, it's in the garden district, so it's surrounded by a nice little garden, a modest little home. 
And so it's understanding the occupant, understanding comfort is key. And have him tell stories about why he operates the building and what way he does, how he does you know, in the wintertime and then also in the summertime. Um, for him, a bang up day is when he raises the thermostat to 64 uh, in the wintertime. Uh, most of the time it's set to 50. So this building, and you know, he's sophisticated enough to talk about that he adjusts his clothing level to shift his comfort, designs for natural ventilation, there's no air conditioning in the house. If you did the, a HERS rating on this building, it would be appalling. But in fact, it's a delightful place to live, and um, uh, you know, he's way off the comfort zones, but he's completely comfortable because he's acclimated to it. And so from these kind of experiences, they start to learn that, that comfort is not just a number, it's, it's, it's an experience and that it varies by person. So in fact, his house, although it would get a terrible HERS rating, has a pretty darn good energy use per square foot. It's uh, sort of 40% low. So I wanted to get back in closing to talk about what I call comfort as the canary in the coal mine. I'm going to take about five minutes here, and then we'll have some time to think and then time for questions. Um, so this is that house in that famous neighborhood, and the delightful man who lives in it, Robert Green, with his two adult sons and an unknown number of grandchildren. Um, you're, there are always kids running in and out, and he runs a business out of his home, so he's home all the time. Um, and his energy use was high, and that was of a concern, but what really happened is I was floored. The students just sort of nonchalantly, we had this CO2 monitor. And I had intended that the students would just use the CO2 to sort of see when people were home or not. Because we exhale, the CO2 level goes up in the building, and then it flushes out at night or, when we're not, or in the daytime when we're not there. In fact, his CO2 levels were, well, the limit of our meter is 2,500 parts per million. And um, so the house was frequently up at 2,500 parts per million. Remember, we all know to our sadness that our current outdoor value is around 400. And uh, we said, what the heck is going on? And I, after some uh, jaw, you know, re twisting of arms, I got the company that went out and installed the original system. I said, maybe the outdoor air inlet isn't working right, or the motorized damper. And I said, there is no motorized damper. Um, and is it working right? Please go out and look and inspect. And what they found was, as part of its lead platinum certification, this house had a HEPA filter, a high performance air filter, to try to address issues around asthma and so on, and, and reducing particulate counts. And that was all good. The problem is that HEPA filters are hard to find. They're not carried at Walmart. And um, so this guy had gotten to a certain point and says, well, I can't get that thing. And then when he asked about it, they were like 50 bucks or 80 bucks a piece. He said, I can't afford that. So what he did was a buddy of his gave him this sort of automotive grade filter that he put over the air return of his, and it worked in series. So the system, the air conditioning system, was just running continually, trying to suck air through these two completely clogged filters. And the only way that this design, the engineer had designed how fresh air gets introduced into this building is it gets drawn in by the Bernoulli effect, by when you use um, the suction of, of air passing when the system is running. But if the system can't move air, it can't draw fresh air in. So we said, hi. Here's a stack of HEPA filters, and why don't you use this one? And, and then we found a supplier and a distributor and so on, and he's taken on for that. So his health and comfort levels have gone up, the CO2 levels are down, and the energy use is down. So comfort and air quality were the canaries in the coal mine that actually correlated with, they were not fighting with, we're, we, don't, we shouldn't be asking people to be less comfortable or less healthy. We should be asking people to be more comfortable and more healthy. Similar story I could tell around a church, a cathedral that we uh, restored after Katrina. Um, and this is a story that clothing level changes everything. Um, so uh, in the uh, building science world, we talk about CLO. It's how we measure how much insulation value people are wearing. It turns out the CLO level of uh, a, a priest is pretty high. And the CLO level of the parishioners uh, is comparatively low, because they're going to go out to their cars, go home, and so on. And so this is a, a chart of temperature versus moisture content in the air. This is the comfort zone of a priest, and this is the comfort zone of his parishioners. But who has control of the thermostat? The priest. And so the, this church we monitored and found out that, in fact, the church was being kept down at 68 degrees. And in fact, the mechanical system was so complex when they tried to explain it to, to the good father that he just said, I don't understand what you're saying. Just set it to 68 and leave it. And the fresh air system was designed for when he, on Easter Sunday, has 300 parishioners there. So they were dehumidifying and cooling enough air for 300 people 24 hours a day. Um, the people were uncomfortable, but when we got his attention was when he got his first $6,000 a month utility bill. 
And so then we were then able, we had, we had standing to speak with him, and we were able to then work with him on ways that improved the occupant comfort and again dropped his energy bill tremendously. We work on our own crew in this, the last story. Um, this is surveying our own people. We use SurveyMonkey. SurveyMonkey is a great tool. You can survey people. And this is where I wanted to say that people are the best sensors. So we asked people, how are you doing right now? And what we found was there was a spatial coordination of where, where people were uncomfortable. We went over there and we found there was actually a leak in the building envelope. And we couldn't have afforded um, 50 temperature sensors. But we had them. They were the people. They knew that they were uncomfortable. So if we just ask them, it can tell us so much. The enemy is, is this philosophy that says that how we get to energy savings and how we get to good building performance is locking things over, is not responding to people. Um, so this is the final three slides talking about that a laboratory building we did where what we did, and I know you're not doing laboratory buildings for the most part, but what we did was we made it so that every individual room in this building can set its own ventilation policy and temperature policy according to the kind of work they're doing. And because of that, we're able to, this is this rank order chart of laboratories in the country. This is the average lab. This is this lab. So we're in one of the harshest climates in America. In theory, the, the worst place to build a laboratory, but we have one of the lowest energy uses per square foot. And it's because we've pushed control down to the level of the occupant. So this is what I thought we could think about, is that uh, in our little cont contemplative time, uh, for me, the problem with architecture is that it's all been about design. And that to think about it instead as a long-term relationship. Sometimes I talk about this as the, the uh, think about architecture. We always talk about our baby, how our baby is coming along. And in fact, the design phase, you know, conception, we start, we talk about the phases in architectural design. We start the conceptual phase. The conceptual phase of a child is often one of the more enjoyable parts of producing a child. Achieving substantial completion, my wife informs me, was quite painful. Um, but then it's done. Here's the kid, great. But you wouldn't say, oh, great, it's done. OK, see you later, right? Because we have responsibility for that. And so one of the changes that we're trying to bring about in architectural practice is to think about, great, you produce this child, it's your child. And the child is most vulnerable during those first few years. And if, at some point, that child will be autonomous to be able to walk in the world. But what we need to do is sort of think about being there through its childhood and learning from its childhood and helping shape how that building learns. Thank you.